patient hearing and I'm very Great. Okay. Uh, perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak and uh, sorry that I could not be there in person with all of you uh, and uh, look forward to sharing my presentation. I'm going to pull up my slides um, and I'm going to hope that, uh, let me just, I'm, oops. Um, I'm hoping that they are visible to you. Yes, no, they are visible. Great. Okay. So we, we got through the hardest part of the presentation. What I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, the American Diabetes Association Standards of Care, and I'll, I'll review some of the new things um, in our standards of care, tell you a little bit about it, um, and then spend a little bit of time of the work that we're doing to go from those guidelines to ultimately having impact to improve care. So um, for those of you that may not be familiar with uh, the American Diabetes Association Standards of Care, each year we publish this uh, comprehensive set of guidelines that are really recognized globally, um, and they cover all aspects of diabetes. Um, and they are put together each year by an amazing uh, group, the Professional Practice Committee, that includes uh, interprofessional leaders of all uh, types, from endocrinologists, uh, nephrologists, cardiologists, diabetes educators, dietitians, pharmacists, uh, really uh, uh, pediatricians, uh, pediatric endocrinologists, a, a wide uh, variety of uh, professionals that look at the evidence each year, pull all the papers, um, and then uh, uh, discuss, debate, and sometimes argue until we develop a consensus. And that is published yearly um, in uh, the end of December, beginning of January in diabetes care. Because so much has been happening in the world of diabetes, a few years ago, we moved to something called the living standards where um, because of the rapid changes, a year is too long to wait to update these guidelines. And therefore we uh, update them during the course of the year as well, some important new information that's out there. So what I wanna do is share with you um, some of the highlights of what's new in the guidelines. This is a comprehensive document, some 200 pages. And so obviously can't cover everything um, in the few minutes that I have, but I, I will tell you about the, the key themes. Um, and I would say the key themes of what's new fall into four areas. Um, new information about screening that I'll talk about. Uh, individualizing care, and I'll focus really on type 2 diabetes, but there's information about individualizing care for people with type 1, uh, the importance of comorbidities, and share some information about that, and then finally around glycemic assessment and technology, an area that is moving very quickly in the world of diabetes. So, What's new in screening um, and, and a few things that I want to alert you to. One, the recommendation that for uh, individuals that are either uh, uh, obese uh, or uh, overweight and have other risk factors for diabetes, they should be screened starting at age 18. Uh, because uh, there are many individuals being diagnosed with diabetes uh, at much younger ages. Uh, and then the second recommendation is that everybody should be screened at least starting at age 35. And that is a change. Used to be at four, age 45, but the recommendations now are screening all individuals starting at age 35. And if those individuals screen negative at that point, uh, then every three years they should be rescreened, or sooner if they develop uh, new symptoms that are suggestive of diabetes. So that is a change. The other changes relate to uh, pregnancy and preconception counseling. Um, and uh, uh, specifically, oh, my battery's running low. Um, specifically around um, 
uh, women that are planning pregnancy should be screened for pre-existing diabetes because that rate is uh, much higher than, um, uh, than we realize. And so all those individuals should be screened. Um, uh, and uh, in addition, um, uh, if they, uh, women should be screened uh, uh, during that first trimester before 15 weeks of pregnancy for pre-existing diabetes. And that's in addition to the typical screening that occurs uh, uh, at uh, uh, the third trimester for uh, gestational diabetes. So let me move on. Um, so the next uh, is around individualizing care. Uh, and here, this has been a journey Uh, we think of individualizing type 2 diabetes care uh, and particularly pharmacological therapy based on these five uh, issues, the presence of comorbidities, hyperglycemia, weight, and how important that is, access and cost, and finally, efficacy. So this is a complex diagram. Um, and I'm going to walk you through it. Um, so uh, I'll I'll point you to the very top, and and I'll magnify that in a moment. But I want you to see that there are sort of two halves. Uh, there's all of this on the left, and then there's the information on the right. And and essentially, the decision about treatment is really uh, moving uh, from one uh, making that decision as to which of those two issues are important. So uh, this is magnifying the top and it says that first line therapy depends on comorbidities uh, and then those other factors, but the comorbidities really dominate and the comorbidities are the presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Um, the presence of cardiovascular disease or atherosclerotic uh, risk factors, presence of heart failure um, or uh, CKD. And uh, here's the new information uh, that uh, we, we think of metformin as first-line therapy, but the, the recognition is that even in the absence of metformin, if you have one of those uh, comorbidities, you should be started on um, uh, the agents that I'll describe in a moment, um, uh, regardless of the presence of metformin. So no longer does one have to wait to use metformin and then move to these other uh, therapies. So now let me move to the diagram below, uh, and this is magnified. So again, um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease, you're on the left side of the diagram, um, independent of the use of metformin, independent of A1C, and here are the three uh, comorbidities described. If one has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or high risk on the far left, it's really an SGLT2 or a, a GLP1. If the individual has heart failure, SGLT2 here in the center. And if they have chronic kidney disease, it really depends on the presence of albuminuria. Um, and I'll walk you through that in a moment. So let me move to the next uh, diagram here. And here is uh, if someone has chronic kidney disease, and it's a matter of whether they have Al albuminuria, in which case SGLT2 is preferred, and that's on the left-hand side. And um, in the uh, new standards, I, you'll see some changes around the cutoff for albuminuria. Um, so really the preference is SGLT2. In the absence of albuminuria, then one can think of either a GLP-1 or an SGLT2. So let me let me highlight this in a case, and I'll I'll ask the audience to think about their response. 
So this is a patient, um, uh, Edward, he's 45 years old. He comes to see you um, because he's, he checked his glucose um, with his mother's glucometer. So uh, hint number one, his mother probably has diabetes uh, and therefore he has risk factors. And he was found to have a blood glucose in the 200s. Um, his A1C is elevated at 9.1. He already has a history of coronary disease uh, and he's on appropriate statin therapy um, and aspirin, and he's on an ACE inhibitor, lisinopril. And you can see his BMI is elevated. He is obese. So he has a number of risk factors, newly diagnosed. Um, and the question I want you to think about is what is the first line of uh, therapy beyond lifestyle? And so here I will give you a series of choices. Uh, if you have access to put it in the uh, chat, please do. Otherwise, just at your seat, write down what you what your choice would be. Would it be starting a sulfonylurea, a uh, glyburide? Uh, would it be an SGLT2 uh, or metformin, GLP1? Or the fifth choice would be, would you start two antihyperglycemic medications? So I'll give you a moment to think about your choices. And I will say that any of these choices are not wrong. I mean, you, you could use any of them, but I wanna use them to highlight how we think about it within the ADA standards of care guidelines. So you've got your choice. So this individual has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So he falls into the left-hand uh, portion of the algorithm, remember, the first step of the algorithm is, do you have one of these comorbidities? You go to the left-hand side. He has uh, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So he, regardless of the use of metformin, should be on either an SGLT2 or a GLP-1. The choice of those um, uh, really is, is uh, you know, something that I, I would discuss with the patient and the willingness of um, taking a tablet or uh, uh, a GLP-1, which of course is available in oral uh, dosage as well, but typically is, a, is an injectable. And how willing they are to take the injectable with the understanding that they will likely uh, have significantly more weight loss. So that really is the treatment. And the question is, um, so it would be either one of those is a reasonable choice, SGLT2 or, or GLP-1, um, but metformin alone would probably delay the initiation of these therapies. You could, um, and this is probably where I would go personally, would be to consider two agents because uh, Edward's A1C was 9.1, and any one agent is likely to lower A1C probably one, one and a half points. And to really get to below seven, they probably need two agents. And so it might be metformin plus SGLT2 or GLP1. So a little bit of the thinking that goes on, as I said, you know, whatever choice you made is, is a reasonable one, but I, I wanted to use that to illustrate uh, the guidelines. So uh, we talked about new screening. Uh, we talked about individualizing pharmacological treatment for type 2. You will see at the EASD meeting in Stockholm uh, next month, the uh, final uh, consensus uh, uh, recommendations by ADA and EASD will be presented there. We presented a draft guidelines uh, at the uh, um, ADA scientific sessions, uh, got a lot of comments, and now we're finalizing it. And those uh, new recommendations will be released uh, 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 in both diabetes care and diabetologia uh, late in September at the time of those presentations. So uh, tune in to that. Um, these are the uh, Boston Gardens. Uh, I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Lovely place. Uh, and uh, I'm going to move now. We talked about screening, individualized care, and now we're going to talk about comorbidities. And, you know, largely the management of uh, diabetes has moved 
beyond a glucose centric view. It's not all about blood glucose, um, but uh, the importance of uh, managing comorbidities. And, and this diagram that I think you'll see reproduced in a lot of places helps to conceptualize that, particularly for our primary care colleagues, that if you want to ultimately um, uh, uh, reduce uh, diabetes complications at the top here, it is lifestyle management and diabetes education. And then the, the four pillars of care that one needs to consider. So glycemic management to the far left, always been there, um, and we know that's important. But we want to really highlight that it's the importance of blood pressure management um, for macrovascular disease, probably even more important than glucose in terms of uh, reducing morbidity and mortality. It's lipid management, and then the use of agents that reduce cardiorenal risk, uh, which is what we just talked about. So important considerations there. Um, some of the other updates uh, of what's new in the standards of care is for the first time providing a guideline around reduction of albuminuria. And so that not only should albuminuria be measured and followed in all people with chronic kidney disease, um, but one should target a reduction of that albuminuria by at least 30%. Um, the other new consideration is the important use of finerenone, um, a uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist that should be added as therapy in individuals with chronic kidney disease to uh, lower not only their progression of chronic kidney disease, but al also congestive heart failure and atherosclerotic disease. And then finally, Ongoing follow-up of individuals with diabetes should be not only EGFR, but ongoing measurement of albuminuria. Um, other co important comorbidity considerations are around uh, COVID vaccination, which continues to be a problem globally, and I, I know there in India as well. Uh, and then some important recommendations, uh, and you'll be seeing more and more about this, uh, around liver disease and diabetes. So diabetes is now becoming the leading cause of liver disease, both of NASH and uh, NF NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Recommendations about screening uh, for those diseases, as well as recommendations um, on medical therapy that can be effective. Pioglitazone, uh, GLP-1 have both been shown to be effective agents. There are some early studies on SGLT2s, and I think we'll see more studies on those. Uh, and there are a number of new medications in the pipeline uh, that uh, will also be um, potential treatments for uh, liver disease in people with diabetes. Um, the other important consideration is cognitive impairment. We now know that people with diabetes are at higher risk for cognitive impairment. Uh, it does appear to be linked to glycemic control. Uh, we should be screening for that cognitive imp impairment and adjusting therapy and complexity of therapy for, based on uh, cognitive impairment that might exist. And there are randomized control trials that show that simplification of therapy in those with cognitive impairment can reduce uh, hypoglycemia and lead to better outcomes. Okay, so we have gone through three of the four uh, uh, themes. And now I wanna move to that fourth theme. We did screening, individualized care, comorbidities, and I want to end talking about glycemic assessment and technology, and then talk uh, finally after that about uh, implementation, uh, which I think is where uh, we are really focusing a lot of our attention at the ADA. So in terms of glycemic assessment, continue to focus on time and range. And for those that are using blood glucose monitoring alone, then it can be readings in range. And the importance for those that use blood glucose monitoring instead of continuous glucose monitoring is to not only check at one time a day, only at fasting, 
but to stagger the times that the measurements are made. And you can see the AGP report here. This is the kind of data that uh, uh, we recommend people looking at. 14 days of measurement is sufficient to make medication adjustments. And there are different target ranges defined uh, uh, that are helpful. And the other important consideration here is that when one is looking at this kind of data, the first thing to look at is the hypoglycemic range and what change in treatment or recommendations or education should be done for the, the, the area in the red zone. That, that hypoglycemia, that's the first point of addressing uh, and then one moves on from there. Uh, other recommendations really are around uh, that 14 days are really sufficient for continuous glucose monitoring measurements to be able to make recommendations and change in therapy. I think that's something we learned during the pandemic when um, really a lot of diabetes management was virtual and uh, those that had continuous glucose monitors were really a great way to be able to assess their glycemic control and make adjustments. Uh, and that that data should be used for medication adjustment. One does not need to wait for A1C measurements. Uh, in addition, came out very strongly uh, based on the evidence, um, and you'll see all the studies summarized in the standards of care, that continuous glucose monitoring should be used for really all people uh, uh, in the pediatric age group, in children, in adults, in older adults, uh, whether uh, they are um, on insulin pump, multi-dose insulin, or basal insulin alone, based on, again, RCT results, um, and, and that that really is a strong recommendation. And we understand that this uh, not all individuals have access and uh, something that we are working on from an advocacy uh, uh, point of view. So um, I went through the four areas that are new, and I want to just share a little bit of our strategy of moving from those guidelines that I just shared with you and how do we get them to impact. And we really think of this in, in four stages. Uh, and, and the first being what I sort of described is creating evidence-based guidelines, letting the science drive what those guidelines are. The rigorous pro process of the standards of care have been in place and I shared those guidelines. The, the next step um, is uh, to the right here, and that is really disseminating those guidelines, because again, just having them really does not impact care. And that's one of the things uh, uh, that I'll, I'll talk about. And then it's about educational programs to make uh, the, make them more clear. And that's, in essence, this kind of program is so valuable in doing and appreciate the invitation. And then finally, the, the quality improvement in the lower right. How do you implement that into practice? And many times this is at the local level looking at how your clinic is organized, who else on the team can help. So on the, on the first step uh, in terms of the dissemination, uh, we've, uh, um, we've been uh, successful here uh, in these are the standards of care. We've already each year, uh, we disseminate this to 4 million people around the world. We're looking to expand that in a number of different ways. Uh, and not only do we have this large document that describes the standards, but we've moved to new ways of uh, disseminating this. And I'll, and I'll show you what's listed here. These are all available free on the website below, professionaldiabetes.org slash SOC. There are the full version. There is an abridged version for primary care that you can see. There's a wonderful app that you can download uh, so that you have that information uh, in real time. It is interactive. It allows you to enter patient information to guide therapy, but it also allows you to search the entire standards of care for keywords to find the information that you want. Uh, there are uh, podcasts, uh, pocket cards available, webinars, uh, and we've been moving uh, to uh, creating visuals 
that make it easier for people with diabetes and their caregivers to understand. And this is just an example of that. So for uh, uh, women with diabetes or planning pregnancy, a quick way to see what those recommendations are. This could be something posted in your clinic. Um, it also is being spread uh, through social media to both healthcare professionals and again to patients so that they can quickly understand what is necessary. Um, so that's how we are working on uh, uh, disseminating the standards of care. Educational programs are what we're doing today, and I've done uh, grand rounds around the country, uh, uh, speaking at programs like this uh, with a global impact that you have and appreciate the invitation. Um, and, and then, you know, moving to uh, um, sort of quality improvement. And we have an initiative that has been going on called Overcoming Therapeutic Inertia. And quickly describe therapeutic inertia is the observation that a patient sees their healthcare provider uh, not at goal for therapy, their A1C is elevated, and they leave without any change in therapy. And it turns out that this happens very commonly. Um, and it is not the fault of the provider or the patient. There are a number of different factors that need to be addressed. I will point you to our website where you'll see short videos that help one address this. Um, and then on the right-hand side is systematic review that has looked at all the interventions that have been uh, looked at to overcome that problem of therapeutic inertia and what has been effective. And it is quality improvement efforts like uh, uh, the ADA's Diabetes Inside that, for example, our previous speaker, Dr. Fonseca, implemented uh, across his health system with great results. Uh, and largely uh, spreading the, the work beyond just the physician to other healthcare team members. So with that, I uh, gave you a sense of what's new in our standards of care, what we're doing about implementing those standards uh, to have impact. And again, appreciate so much the invitation to speak to all of you um, and to uh, uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much.